So next up we have Sanjeev Khanna, who's going to tell us about sublinear algorithms for hierarchical clustering. All right, thanks Madhu, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. And um, so the work I'm going to talk about is a joint work with the uh, uh, three students from Penn, uh, Arpit, Juan, and Pratamesh. Uh, Arpit recently graduated and uh, is now doing a postdoc at Columbia, okay? Okay, so the hierarchical clustering problem is something that we have already touched upon, but just for the benefit of people who are joining uh, just now, let me briefly uh, define and motivate the problem. So it's a technique for um, organizing your data uh, as a multi-level hierarchy based on similarity information uh, among the data points. And in particular, the top of the hierarchy uh, contains the entire data set and the successive levels of hierarchy are obtained by repeatedly splitting the data set. And the informal objective here is that things which are very similar, you want them to stay together across multiple levels of this hierarchy. Okay? So in this toy example that's shown here, you have a data set which consists of a group of professionals. And then at the top level, these professionals are split as uh, STEM and non-STEM professionals. Then the group of STEM professionals is further split as the healthcare versus tech and so on. Okay? So a bit more formally, um, the output of a hierarchical clustering is a rooted tree. And for the purposes of this talk, you should just assume that the tree will always be binary. And so it's a rooted tree where the root is going to represent the entire data set. The leaves are going to be singleton data points and the internal nodes will correspond to subsets of data that, is, uh, uh, that corresponds itself corresponds to the descendant leaves of this internal node. So you can think of uh, hierarchical clustering as giving you um, a clustering of the data at multiple levels of granularity simultaneously. Okay? This is in contrast to flat clustering where you specify upfront the number of clusters you want and I want the data to be clustered in exactly these many clusters. Okay? So this is a very popular technique for organizing data based on similarity information you could use it to analyze the community structure in a social network at different levels of granularity. You could use it to analyze images at multiple levels of granularity. And you can also use it to build uh, phylogenetic trees uh, on, for species based on similarity information. Now, there have been lots of popular heuristics um, for this problem and for a long time, but it was relatively recently that um, a particular um, formalization was put forward for this problem that uh, has since then has received uh, quite a bit of attention. And this is the formalization that we are going to uh, consider in this talk. So this formalization was put forward by Das Gupta in 2016. And, uh, and here is the setup. The input is going to be a weighted graph uh, and the vertices of these graphs are going to be the data points. And the data points are connected by weighted edges and the weight on these edges indicate how similar the data points are to each other. Now, once you have this input um, and you uh, give a hierarchical clustering tree, P, then we can associate a cost with this tree in the following manner. Every node in the tree corresponds to splitting the data into two parts. So if you have a node that represents the data set S, and it's split into two parts, SL and SR, then the cost associated with this node is going to be cardinality of S times the total weight of the edges that go from SL to SR, okay? And now if you want to know the cost of the entire tree, you sum up these costs over all the internal nodes of the tree, and that's going to be your total cost. And the goal is to find a tree that minimizes this particular cost function. I, I, I will uh, come to that in a moment. Question? I'll come to that in a Can moment. Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah. The question was that, um, can you uh, briefly motivate why this is the right cost function? And I'll just uh, address that in a moment. 
And also, can you tell us, uh, so we, uh, edges of high weight should be kept close or far? Uh, just to understand. Uh, ed edges of high weight indicate things are very similar. And so you don't want to cut them early on. Okay. So here is just, a, a, again, a simple illustration of the objective function. So here you have a hierarchical clustering tree. And at the top level, the uh, entire data set V is being partitioned into two sets, A and B. And the cost you pay for this top level split is cardinality of V times the total weight of edges that go from A to B. Okay. And similarly, at the next level, A is being split into C and D. And the cost you pay for that split is cardinality A times weight of the edges from C to D and so on. Okay. So why this particular cost function? And Das Gupta makes a case for this cost function by putting forward um, several desirable properties. And, uh, and this is not a unique cost function which will satisfy those properties, but this happens to be one which satisfies uh, these desirable properties. So the first, being, uh, first one being that if your data consists of um, uh, connected components with no edges between them, then the optimal tree should uh, basically first separate out these connected components before it starts cutting between them. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, property and many data uh, objective functions would satisfy it. The second one was that um, if your input graph is a clique, which means every pair of data points is equally similar, then no particular hierarchy that your output should be favored over another one. Okay. And this cost function has the property that all hierarchical clustering trees are going to end up giving uh, the same uh, objective function value. Okay. But then finally, he also looks at um, some um, planted models where there are planted clusters and, and shows that under some settings um, of these planted models, this particular objective function will actually end up recovering those planted clusters, okay? Uh, in a subsequent work, uh, Kohan, Adad, and others um, actually explored, you know, what constitutes a good cost function in great detail. And, uh, and they took, put forward an axiomatic framework for identifying good cost functions. And Das Gupta's cost function happens to be one of the good cost functions, but they also identify some other cost functions which would constitute good cost functions, okay? But for this talk, we're just going to focus on the Das Gupta objective function. Okay, so what do we know about uh, uh, computing a hierarchical clustering tree in uh, this objective function? Uh, we know that the problem of finding the best tree is uh, NP hard. And we also know if you assume small set expansion, then even getting a constant factor approximation uh, is NP hard. On the other hand, there is a very natural algorithm called the recursive sparse cut algorithm, which basically partitions the data repeatedly by finding a sparse cut in the graph. And this has been, uh, it was actually put forward already in the work of Das Gupta, uh, but his analysis uh, was a bit slack uh, in uh, analyzing this heuristic. And, uh, and he showed that uh, it will give order alpha log n approximation to this objective function where alpha is the approximation guarantee for the sparse cut problem. Subsequent work um, by multiple groups of people actually showed that uh, this heuristic will give you an order alpha approximation where alpha is the guarantee you have for sparse cut. Okay? And the currently best known guarantee for sparse cut is root log n. So this is an order root log n approximation algorithm. One uh, useful fact um, uh, to keep in mind, um, as uh, um, um, especially as in the later parts of the talk, I'll uh, briefly talk about lower bounds, is that uh, if you're willing to lose an additional constant factor in approximation ratio, you can actually assume the following property about your hier hierarchical clustering tree, that at every internal node, the data is going to be partitioned into roughly equal size sets, okay? It's like one third, two third balanced partition, okay? And this will only cost you an order of uh, one factor loss in the approximation quality. Okay, so the motivating question for this talk is that, uh, you know, 
um, can we design sublinear algorithms which have uh, essentially the same um, performance guarantee as the currently best known algorithms for hierarchical clustering? Okay. And when I say sublinear, I mean sublinear in the number of edges here. Okay. And our goal is to output an actual hierarchical clustering tree. So of course, based on the computational platform, the resource that you want to be sublinear in uh, uh, would vary. And uh, it could be space, it could be time, uh, or it could be communication if your data is distributed. So very quickly, um, if the, when the resource in question, uh, we want to optimize this space, we will be assuming the streaming model of computation. And I'll just quickly go through these models because they have been talked about in various talks here already. And uh, so the streaming model was uh, already discussed extensively yesterday. Um, when the resource in question is uh, time, we are going to be working with the query model uh, of computation. And here you will assume you have access to the graph through queries of the following form. You could query degree of a vertex. You could ask whether or not there's an edge uh, between any two pair of vertices U or V, or given a vertex V and an integer K, which is between one and the degree of this vertex, you can ask the uh, query to return the Kth neighbor of this vertex. Okay? And of course, um, as I'm just setting this up, I'm only focusing on you know, number of queries. We, of course, afterward also want to make sure that we can compute with the information that these queries have gathered and actually output a good solution efficiently. Okay. And finally, when the resource is uh, communication, we'll uh, assume the MPC model of computation, which Wahab also talked about. And uh, so again, uh, we're assuming here that the edges are partitioned across multiple machines and uh, the computation is going to proceed in rounds. And each machine has a small amount of memory. Definitely, you know, we want to assume to be much smaller than your input graph size. And a typical goal here is um, to figure out if you can perform the computation in a very small number of rounds of, uh, 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 of computation while maintaining the property that each machine has small amount of memory. Okay? And very small is uh, what's desirable typically is constant number of rounds. Okay, so at a high level, our results are going to be that um, uh, in all three uh, models of computation, it's possible to get um, uh, efficient sublinear algorithms for hierarchical clustering. And, uh, and I, uh, we will also, uh, we also get lower bound results, which basically show that these algorithms are essentially best possible up to polylog factors. One piece of notation that I will use throughout is um, I'll use N to denote the number of uh, vertices in the graph and M to denote the number of edges. Okay, so the first result um, is for the streaming model of computation. And, uh, and here we can show that uh, uh, with O tilde N space, you have a streaming algorithm that can allow you to recover a one plus small O of one approximate solution to the problem, okay? And uh, it may seem a bit surprising that the uh, guarantee has improved from order root log n to one plus small O of one. And it's simply because in the streaming model, uh, we are not constraining time. So you are welcome to solve uh, NP hard problems. Um, but if you want to restrict yourself to polynomial time, then the result should be interpreted as saying that in O tilde n space, you can uh, compute an order root log n approximation to this problem. The algorithm also works for um, uh, in dynamic streams where the input graph is even revealed as a sequence of insertion and deletion, okay? And it's also not hard to show that you need omega n space to output any or tilde, any polylog approximation, approximate solution to the hierarchical clustering problem, okay? And what we're going to see is that this particular result um, is going to follow immediately from previously known results once you look at the problem 
in the right way. So it's going to be a very easy uh, corollary of just, um, I would even say just kind of uh, setting up the problem in the right manner. Okay. Same is true for the next uh, positive result and which is um, that in the MPC model of computation, um, if you, um, you can actually compute a one plus small o of one approximate solution in just two rounds um, using machines of size O tilde n. Okay. So at the end of those two rounds, a dedicated machine called coordinator is going to output um, a one plus small o of one approximate solution. Now you can ask the question, um, uh, can we improve this to one round? And here we can show a lower bound result that uh, if you wanted to do the same in one round, then even if the graph is unweighted, you need machines which have memory at least n to the fourth third. Okay. So there is a price to pay um, if you want to reduce the number of rounds to one. Okay, finally, um, let me tell you about uh, what we can show in the setting of the sublinear query slash time. So I'll start with the, uh, uh, just talking about the number of queries needed. So here, um, if you're given an unweighted graph with M edges, then uh, the algorithm that we have will take a linear time, which is order N plus M time, um, as long as the number of edges M is uh, less than equal to N to the fourth third. So which is to say you're not gaining anything, you're really reading the entire graph. Okay. But once M exceeds N to the fourth thirds, you start to get an improvement in the number of queries needed. And in fact, by the time M reaches N to the three half, the total number of queries will collapse to O tilde N. And from there on, it's just going to remain O tilde N. Okay. So up to N to the fourth third, no improvement. And after that, you start to get improvement. There is a question. Uh, sorry, uh, this one where you assume that the endpoints have to have or something? No, so this is for unweighted. What I'm stating here is for unweighted. Yes, yes. Good. Okay, and uh, and um, so uh, here I just spoke about number of queries, but in fact you can carry these results also to the setting of time, and uh, and here we can um, rely on a, a result of. Uh, Sherman combined with the recent breakthrough on the max flow algorithms and to basically show that for any tau greater than zero, you can get roughly n to the one plus tau time algorithm on top. You need to invest this on top of the number of queries to recover a solution, which is uh, close to an order root log n approximation. Okay. Now we can get similar guarantees for the weighted setting, but this will require us to assume uh, uh, the input is organized in a certain nice manner. And uh, as the question before al already was uh, suspecting that if the input is weighted and arbitrarily organized, uh, the problem should be hopeless. Okay. In the, this talk, I will only uh, talk about the unweighted case uh, for sublinear query and time. A final result is uh, that uh, the query complexity that we put forward uh, in the pre previous result uh, is essentially the best possible. And for every edge density, um, you can construct graphs where which will show that you can't do much better than the query complexity that we described. Okay, so before I tell you uh, the very simple ideas, everything is uh, follows from very simple ideas. Um, in this work. Um, so before I describe those very simple ideas, um, let me just talk about, uh, uh, tell you about uh, two very recent independent works, um, both, which, uh, both of them happened in the last month. So the first one is the work of uh, Sepper and Wahab and others, um, which is uh, looking at uh, the problem of estimating the value of hierarchical clustering as opposed to outputting a hierarchical clustering. 
and, uh, and their focus is uh, to look at this question in the setting of a streaming model of computation. And they show several negative results that even estimating the value in one pass, if you have space which is much less than n, turns out to be a hard task. Now they do get two results, which are very similar to results that we get. Uh, namely, they get um, an algorithm which uses O tilde n space and outputs um, a constant factor approximation to hierarchical clustering. And they also get a two round MPC algorithm, just like our work. There is a small difference in the nature of our results. Um, we are able to show that you can get a one plus small O of one approximation. Whereas the, the way their analysis proceeds, um, they, um, they get an absolute constant strictly greater than one, and they cannot go below that constant. Okay? But qualitatively, they are similar results. The second result is also focused on estimating the hierarchical clustering value. And it's by Michael Kaprolov and others. Michael is going to um, be giving a talk in the next session. And here they focus on a restricted class of graphs and which are called K comma epsilon clusterable graphs. You can think of these graphs as graphs which uh, consist of uh, K expanders uh, weakly connected to each other. And in this setting, they show that you can get an order root log K approximation using a number of queries which is roughly poly k times uh, n to the half plus epsilon. Okay. Um, so you are getting a result which is, uh, you know, way below n uh, in this setting. Okay. All right. So let me start by talking about, um, in the remaining time, telling you about uh, uh, the very simple ideas that uh, lead to our sublinear algorithms. And then I hope to show um, at least one lower bound idea. Okay. Okay. So again, a quick reminder of the objective function. Given any hierarchical clustering tree, if cost is obtained by summing over the costs over all the internal nodes, and the cost at any internal node is the number of vertices at that node times the total weight of the edges that the partition defined by this node cuts. Okay. So here is a very natural idea. Um, why don't we work with uh, an approximate cut sparsifier? After all, we are talking about weight of the edges cut, right? And, and the problem is that um, at the top level cut, right, the cut sparsifier of an entire graph is indeed a very good object to work with. But as you go further down, you're working with induced subgraphs. And now you need values of cuts inside these induced subgraphs. Okay. But still, we have uh, this simple um, relationship that allows us to express the value of the edges cut in any induced uh, subgraph as uh, a linear combination of cut queries on the original graph. Okay. So you can just express it using this. The problem is that uh, in this linear combination, we have uh, uh, both positive and negative terms. And, uh, and once you introduce error, now the difference could have unbounded error, okay? Okay, but uh, we are going to um, get some help from the particular nature of our objective function. And uh, so in particular, um, Notice that if you look at, uh, so here is a, a, a toy example, and notice that uh, if you look at the split at the node uh, B, that split, its cost has a negative term, which is this quantity highlighted in yellow, minus WG BB bar. That same term also will appear in its parent's cost expression, but this time with the positive, uh, coefficient. And not only that the coefficient is positive, it is strictly larger because the sizes are decreasing as you go down the tree. Okay. And that simple, really simple observation um, has the following upshot 
um, you can just work out the simple details that you can express the cost of any tree as a non-negative linear combination of cut values in your graph. Okay? And so we do not have to worry about this uh, uh, difference issue. Okay? And so we get a black box reduction to cut sparsifiers. And now if you wanted to get a one plus small of one approximate hierarchical clustering, all you need to do is build a one plus small of one approximate cut sparsifier, okay? So algorithmically speaking, rest of the talk is going to focus on this task um, in some way, version or the other, okay? Okay, so uh, these two results just follow now immediately from the known work. Uh, the first one is the streaming result of O tilde N, a space algorithm that follows from the seminal work of Anne Gua and McGregor, um, which gave a linear sketch, which can do this uh, even in dynamic streams. And the same linear sketching uh, algorithm can be easily implemented in the MPC model uh, with just two rounds and O tilde N space memory. Okay? The fact that it's a linear sketch allows you to compose things together and it's just literally follows from their work. Okay? The more interesting problem to tackle is um, um, how are we going to handle this task in the setting of sublinear query model? And, um, uh, you know, leave aside the cut sparsifiers, building cut, cut sparsifiers in sublinear queries, even connectivity would require omega m queries, okay? So we cannot just now say that we will build um, a cut sparsifier in sublinear number of queries. So what we're going to do is uh, we will <clears throat> relax the notion of cut sparsifier and, um, and we will see um, uh, we can work with something much weaker and still get uh, one plus small of one uh, approximation kind of guarantees. Okay. So what is this uh, uh, weaker notion? Um, so I'm going to say that a graph H is an epsilon delta um, sparsifier of another graph G. If um, it has the following property, for any cut SS bar, the weight of the cut in this graph H is going to be within a one plus minus epsilon factor of the weight in the original graph. This part is same as the standard cut sparsifiers. But this time I'm going to also allow you to have an additive error term. And what's the additive error term? It's going to be delta times min of S comma S bar, okay? So same definition as usual cut sparsifier with an additional additive error term, which is um, delta times the size of the smaller of the two sides. So in this notation, um, the usual cut sparsifier, the epsilon zero cut sparsifier. Yes. Uh, it, it's not important, and uh, but for our purposes, it's this version which is kind of easiest to think about. Yeah, no, but it's not important. Okay, so here is a, a very. Uh, simple observation, uh, simple, uh, easy to prove lemma, that uh, if you have an epsilon delta sparsifier um, of, a, of a graph, then uh, for any tree, you're going to basically preserve the cost of the tree to within a one plus minus epsilon factor, but you will have an additional additive error term, which is going to be order delta times n squared, okay? So we will, this is the price we are going to pay for working with this relaxed notion, okay? Okay, so I'm going to focus on unweighted graphs as I mentioned early on. And, uh, and here is the plan. And it's a very simple and natural plan. And fortunately for us, this natural plan will just work out. So first, you know, we're going to kind of observe that uh, larger the delta, the easier it is going to be to compute uh, an epsilon delta sparsifier, which is intuitive, right? The more error you allow, the easier it's going to be. But then the question is that, you know, our goal is to get a one plus small of one approximation. 
how large can we make this delta and still walk away with one plus small of one approximation. And for this, we are going to identify an easy to compute lower bound on the cost of uh, optimal hierarchical clustering. And if we compute this lower bound to be C for our instance, then we can set delta to be something like C over N square. And then we will still, the additive error will still be absorbed as a small order term. And that's it, that's the plan, okay? And what is this easy to compute lower bound? Uh, you can show that uh, for any graph with the M edges and N vertices, the cost of the hierarchical clustering is going to be at least omega M square over N. And this is again also not uh, difficult to show and not uh, very interesting proof. So uh, I'm just going to uh, assume this from here on. But let's interpret this uh, um, uh, for the purposes of seeing the algorithmic idea. So suppose uh, you have a graph G, which uh, has uh, more than n to the three half edges. Then this says that the optimal cost is going to be, you know, more than n squared. And this means if you set delta to be order one, then um, the additive error term is absorbable. So in the rest of the, the next uh, few minutes of discussing this idea, let us just focus on this density regime. So the density regime being M is uh, much larger than N to the three half. And let's see how we can solve the problem with O tilde N queries, okay? Which is what we claimed, okay? Okay, and so we will construct an epsilon comma order one specifier. Now, how do you build a standard cut sparsifier? There are many different algorithms and I'm going to just state one here, which actually is used to construct something even stronger than a cut sparsifier, but for our purposes, it will turn out to be just one of the cleaner algorithms to look at. And so this is an algorithm uh, due to Spielman and Shirvasva. And basically it says that uh, roughly speaking, to construct a one plus minus epsilon cut sparsifier, you repeat the following process order n log n over epsilon square time. You sample edges uh, with probabilities proportional to their effective resistance. And uh, so you sample an edge UV with probability proportional to effective resistance between U and V. And if you are not totally familiar with the notion of effective resistance for the purposes of this talk, just think of it as uh, one over the edge connectivity between U and V that can be supported on short paths or something. Okay. Okay, so that is an algorithm. You're going to just do this sampling and, and log n over epsilon square times. And at the end, you're going to get your cut sparsifier. Okay? And of course, the difficulty is how in the, we are going to estimate all these effective resistance values in sublinear time. And here is the simple fix. We're going to add a constant degree expander on top of our given input graph. Okay, so you have an input graph G and we will add on top a constant degree expander G prime. And, uh, and the simple observation is that uh, if you now build a standard cut sparsifier for the combined graph, okay? So the combined graph is G union G prime. You build a standard epsilon zero uh, sparsifier for the combined graph, then it is going to be an epsilon order one cut sparsifier for my original graph, G, okay? And this just immediately follows from the fact I'm adding a constant degree expander, okay? Okay, so here is our new goal now. Just build an epsilon zero cut sparsifier for this graph H, okay? Which is union of G and G prime. Okay, so I have been saying that problem of building epsilon zero sparsifiers is hard. So question is what have we gained by transforming our input graph T into this new graph H, okay? What we have gained is that now we can pin down the effective resistance values for any edge UV into a very narrow band of quantities, which is easy to compute, okay? And what's that narrow band? It's basically uh, our UV is sandwiched between one over smaller of the degrees of U comma V on one side and it's bounded by order log n times the same value, okay? 
So this is a narrow band in which we can sandwich it. And why is that? Uh, the lower bound is uh, easy. It can never be, uh, uh, it has to be at least as large as one, of, one over the min degree between U and B. For the upper bound, um, there is a, a well-known result of uh, Alan Fries, which says that uh, if you have a constant degree expander and I give you any two sets, um, X and Y of vertices, then uh, roughly speaking, you can route on H to Schwein pass, uh, min of X comma Y H to Schwein pass, you can find them from X to Y, such that all of these paths are, have length only order log. So what is X and Y for us? You have two vertices U and V, X will be all the neighbors of U and Y will be all the neighbors of V and that's it. Basically, this is the idea, okay? And, um, <clears throat> and you can uh, now, um, once you have uh, this, uh, um, uh, uh, this result, uh, you basically now get the following algorithm for building an epsilon zero sparsifier for the graph H. Um, for O tilde n over epsilon squared steps, you're just going to sample a random vertex and then sample a random edge incident product. Okay, that's it. And this we can do now. Okay, okay so this will give us what we wanted to show for in the regime when m is uh, greater than n to the three half. In the regime when m is smaller than n to the three half, the delta you need to work with needs to be smaller than one. It can't be order one because you can only tolerate much smaller additive error. But it's the same idea. And this time you will add an expander where the edges have weight not one, but weight delta. Okay, it's just some quantity less than one. And then the band in which you will sandwich these effective resistance values is now um, takes a hit of another factor of one over delta. Okay, that's all that will change. Okay, so your complexity is going to go up by this delta, okay? And this is the reason that in the regime, when the number of edges is less than n to the four third, we are going to be end up, uh, we will be ending up getting something which is not, you know, O tilde n, okay? Okay, um, yeah. Yes, so that is the hit of delta. That's why the number of times you sample is n, not n over epsilon square, is n over delta epsilon square. Good. Okay, and I, sh I should mention that um, uh, this trick of using um, an um, uh, expander to speed up uh, cut value estimation has already been used um, uh, in an um, old paper of Yin Tat Lee, where he was interested in um, recovering the value of a single cut obliviously chosen um, by an adversary to within small additive error. The difference for our setting is that we need these guarantees to hold for all the cuts in the graph, okay? But uh, really he had this idea of working with an expander to speed up things. So um, I just want to explicitly credit that. Okay, um, good. So I'm being told I have very few uh, minutes left. I'm just want to show you maybe one lower bound idea and, uh, and then uh, I'll just wrap up, okay? Okay, so let me show you um, the idea behind uh, why, um, you know, if you wanted to get an MPC algorithm with one round, uh, you would need the machine memories to be at least n to the four third large. Okay, so I'm going to just explain this um, um, just through pictures, okay? Okay, so here is uh, what our input graph is going to look like. Uh, there are two, um, uh, the graph is supported on two disjoint sets of vertices, V1 and V2. Uh, both V1 and V2 have N vertices each. So what is the graph G of V1? It's a collection of uh, N to the one third bipartite cliques each clique has uh, uh, n to the two third vertices. Okay. What's graph GV2? It is also a union of bipartite cliques, but the cliques this time are only uh, containing n to the one third vertices, okay? So it's n to the two third cliques of size n to the one third. So the top graph has about n to the five third edges. The bottom graph has about n to the four third edges. 
And so the total number of machines we'll have, imagine you had an algorithm and uh, which was working with machines of size uh, less than n to the fourth third minus epsilon. So then the total number of machines which has the entire input is at least n to the one third now. Okay, so here is the key idea. And if I just can co convey the key idea, then I think it's already good. Um, so the key idea is this. Um, here is how we will set up a hard instance. Each machine is going to get a graph that's going to be isomorphic to GB2. And how will we accomplish this? We are going to accomplish this by doing a tiling of all the cliques in GV1 by using graphs which look isomorphic to GV2. So in this uh, toy example, I'm tiling the graphs in GV1 by blue cliques. And those four blue cliques are going to be isomorphic to GV2. Then the rest of the graph is being tiled by red cliques. They're also isomorphic to GV2 and so on. So what this means is that a machine cannot tell locally whether it received a copy of GV2 or the red clicks or the blue clicks, okay? It cannot tell this information. On the other hand, any hierarchical clustering solution, which is of good quality, must learn how vertices are partitioned across clicks in GV2, okay? Otherwise, it will be just cutting through the clicks at the top level. And remember at the top level, the penalty for cutting edges is factor N, okay? So you don't want to be cutting these things at the top level, okay? And then the final thing is just that um, since no machine has uh, any specific knowledge of whether they have GV2 or not, each machine needs to convey to the coordinator information about the partition of the cliques how the vertices are partitioned across the clicks in its copy. And that requires omega n bits of information. There are n to the one third machines. And if all of them communicate that to the coordinator, it needs to have more than n to the four, four third memory. That's it. So that's the basic idea. And then you know, there's some work in formalizing these things, but it can all be done. Okay? So let me, in the interest of time, let me just wrap up here. So we gave extremely simple um, algorithms which are sublinear algorithms for hierarchy clustering. And then there's a bit more work involved in proving that these simple algorithms are best possible that uh, you can do, but uh, even that it's not you know, too hard to show. And, um, and then I think in terms of uh, the main uh, interesting open questions at this point is uh, um, the question that is, uh, already um, initiated in the work of Michael Kaprilov and others. Um, if you just wanted to estimate the value of hierarchical clustering, is it possible to do it in a much smaller number of queries than what we get in general graph? Okay, so the, uh, the current result is for a special class of clusterable graph. Is it possible to beat the query complexity for outputting a tree um, in general graph? if you only wanted the value. Okay. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, I just wanted to understand this uh, expanded trick a little better. So. Um, is it possible to sort of, because your algorithm really doesn't need the expander, because when you finally no. sample the edges, you're just sampling edges of the original graph. Yes, yes. So aren't you just claiming that if you sample edges in the original graph according to some distribution, Absolutely. you get some sparse effect? Absolutely. This is just a way of seeing why that's going to work out. Okay. So in fact, we had an, a direct proof of this thing. Um, uh, previously, which was just based on sampling edges in the original graph and basically saying that whatever is the additional additive error you get, you're not going to get multiplicative guarantees if you're sampling so little edges. Uh, it's good enough for us. But um, this particular way, I am now, um, I, I, I've come to like it. And so I've presented in this way because it just makes it uh, very easy to see conceptually what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. So uh, I actually uh, have, uh, I'll pick like the top two questions asked <laughs> right now. 
So the first is, so you only talk about the unweighted graphs in the sublinear query model. So is that absolutely necessary or only for the master presentation? No, so as I said, you can uh, carry the results to weighted graphs, but you have to assume that the data is presented in a friendly format. So for each vertex, you want to, you will, you will assume that the um, uh, edges of each weight class are uh, uh, in separate groups, okay? If you don't make such assumptions, then I can do the following. I'll take a dense graph of unit weight edges and bury inside it a very sparse erdos renier graph with high weight edges. And now you need uh, omega M queries to discover all of those edges, good, okay? Good. So, so you need to make some assumptions if you wanted to get such yes. results for weighted graph. Okay, because I thought you only need that for the lower bound, but no, you actually need it for that spanner, sorry, expander idea also. Good. The other thing that have you look at MPC, like let's say with extremely small memory and to the epsilon thing, is it? Possible? No, we have not looked at the end to the epsilon memory setting and, uh, and one has to also kind of think a bit more carefully that uh, what is the model for recovering the tree. And, uh, but, uh, but one can think of a query model where you, know, um, uh, you tell um, for any pair of vertices, what's the level it was partitioned or something like that. But we have not looked at that setting. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, so have you thought about partitioning vertices instead of edges? and make some assumptions like overlapping partitions that you get all the edges that are relevant to the hierarchy. We are cluster. partitioning vertices in the clustering every time. No, but at the beginning, you assume that the oh, edges are partitions oh, across the machine. Oh, in the, the model? Uh, no, we have not looked at it. But I mean, uh, I see what you mean. So you mean that vertices are partitioned, but it's overlapping partitioned and so on. Um, no, but uh, you, you're hoping that you can get something better because that's a particular way of... Um... So it's just that in some applications, partitioning vertices make more sense. sense. Uh, not, in okay. not all applications, for example, uh, in Vahop's talk, if you think about graph building applications, the ones that you have to build the graph, you have access to vertices, it. but... I got it. No, so we have not thought about that setting, yes. So I'll take one last question. So, uh, I mean, I'll take it myself. <laughs> um, uh, did you, th uh, what happens with, uh, is there any other definition of clustering which satisfies the axioms for which say the query complexity results could be improved? You mean any other notion of uh, objective function? Right. Yeah. Where we could uh, also get such results, you mean? Or better maybe in uh, some cases? Yeah, so uh, I think, okay, so it's uh, something I've not uh, thought about in detail, but I think if I remember correctly in the Kohan Adat paper, um, if the multiplier was not just the number of nodes at the set S, but it is that raised to power something greater than one, it would also be a valid um, cost function, a uh, good cost, well-behaved cost function. And then these things are going to, I believe, just carry through. And, uh, and some may even get better because one of the difficulty we have is uh, the value of delta is dictated by the lower bound on the objective function value. And if you have a more aggressive cost function, then you could uh, be more aggressive by setting higher delta and get lower query complexity. Okay. All right, so it looks like it's a good time for a break. So let's thank Sanjeev again. Thank you.